Okay, so the last lecture we do memory and memory is important because a lot of what you see is dependent on what we've learned in the past. Um, we've taught about um, how when you see a word that's misspelled you often um, see it for the correct spelling by mistake because you expect certain letters to be there. It's hard to, to edit your own um, prose because you've typed that word and you think you've typed it correctly. And um, so, the, so in terms of memory, there's different, memory means different things. So it could mean what information you store. For example, the, the, you, you store the, your, the memory of your grandmother, but it could also mean uh, the place in the brain that stores it. The, the actual synapse in which it's stored. And learning is the process of creating these new memories. And we'll, we'll see uh, what, what structures are involved in the, the, this process. And remembering is retrieving those memories. And unfortunately, we know very little about how that process works, what, what brain areas are involved in the retrieval of memory. Now, in terms of what types of memories there are, we covered one important type, and that was uh, working memory. And you can see that working memories uh, can be of different types. It can um, store things like, uh, here you can see um, uh, numbers being stored here when you do math, and then the words of a sentence being stored when you're trying to uh, make up a sentence to, to speak or to understand the sentence that you've heard. Um, and most of that occurs in the frontal lobe here. Now, another type of memory is long-term memory. And of these, we have two types. The first type is called procedural, or knowing how to do something. And um, the characteristics of it, it is that it takes time to learn this type of memory. So like skiing takes time to learn. Um, so you need lots of practice. The other surprising thing is that if I told you, asked you now, you know, can you ride a bicycle? you can sort of remember that you had written it in the past, but, but whether you know that skill right now, it's hard to tell until I give you a bicycle to ride on. So you're not conscious of knowing something. You, you remember those habits from the past, but the actual skill you can't recall. And it starts to develop right from birth, and it's not affected by amnesia, so we'll cover um, one form of amnesia today. And it's stored uh, in all kinds of places. For example, we'll see it's, it's stored in the motor cortex. Um, it's, we learned in the past that a lot of things happen in V1. Um, helped the, their procedural me memories for vision. Um, the ability to, the, to see binocularly with two eyes is something that we learned when we were young. Now, the other type of long-term memory is declarative. And so it's the names of objects and events um, and their representation. And one of the key characteristics is that it involves associations. So you, you, you remember a face and you tag a name to it, uh, and then gradually build up all kinds of characteristics. The person's gait, um, the, the sound of a person's voice, and all kinds of things as you get to know the person. And one is conscious, and one establishes this, a lot of these associations, in one trial. So you can meet a person, the person tell, tells you his or her name, and you can remember it in one trial. 
and one is conscious of remembering it. You can ask yourself, do I remember this person's name or not? Um, and it needs time to start developing. So um, it needs, for example, um, your working memory to have developed properly in order to you be for you to be able to form this type of declarative memory. And it is affected by amnesia. And the learning of this involves a structure called the hippocampus, which we'll cover in detail later in this lecture. And, it, and it's, the, it's in the medial temporal lobe, so it's underneath the brain at the very middle of it. And again, um, the, 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 but, so that's where learning occurs, but these memories are stored all over the place. So um, all your association areas involved but in particular, the temporal lobe, and in particular, the underside of the temporal lobe. Now, one of these types of declarative memories are, are called semantic. And um, that's, that's remembering the faces and places. Um, now, interestingly, enough, um, the FFA, here you can see both sides of it, um, is located here on the other side of the brain. And then beside it is a, an area called the parachampal place area. So it's where places are stored. So um, like the picture of the Eiffel Tower that you can see here when you're shown the Eiffel Tower this place, like this area lights up. Um, and there's many other places underneath the brain here in which all kinds of other objects and places are stored. Now, the last type of uh, long-term declarative memory is episodic. And um, that involves the remembering objects and places in one person's past. So I, I remember here, these are my three kids, and we went, I was on sabbatical, and we visited uh, the Eiffel Tower. And uh, now the, everyone here is in their middle 40s. So they, they all have two children each. So it, though that's an example of episodic memory. So remembering, you know, tagging where, uh, with when it was, and all kinds of associations with that. And it also involves things like just as you walk down the streets, sort of remembering the, the places in sequence that you walk through and developing a map of the layout of the place that you live. Now, so where, where are these things stored? Well, it, it, things are stored on, on the other side of the brain here, but in the, throughout the Watt stream. Um, and things are stored where they're uh, activated when you first see them. So when you, you're first observing something, you activate the, the, the what stream and eventually it's where parts of the, whatever it is that you're trying to remember is stored. So there are the synapses that get changed and modified and um, just hold that particular memory in place. And we saw that uh, um, the FFA for example stores your faces that you remember and if it's gone then you have prosopagnosia. Okay, we're going to look at now each of these types of memory in more detail now. And we'll first start off with working memory. So your task here is to, I'll show you a sequence of, of words and then I'll ask you which, whether or not the word I sh now show you 
in something I just showed you or not. Okay. No writing down. <laughs> you gotta work with your working memory. That give you a little pause. I hope. Okay. So yeah. <laughs> good. Next one. Good. Next one. Yep. A little harder. It takes a bit longer because they're not it takes it's hard to remember uh, words that aren't real. It's easier to remember words that you remember. So you saw that what one of the characteristics uh, was that this one was really loud because it was the last word I showed you and uh, was the easiest to remember. This word was one of the first words I showed you. So that took a bit of time, you know. And also, if there was, I had a very long string of words, you would have sort of pushed this word out of your working memory and forgotten it. Because the working memory has a, a limited capacity, unlike your long-term memories, which I, we've yet to discover what the capacity of long-term memories are. But we know it, it, it's very few items in the um, in the in the working memories, but the interesting thing is that you've got different compartments of working memory. So you've got one compartment, let's say, that stores spatial locations. For example, the objects in this room. Um, another one for the words I say. Okay, you're, as I'm saying them, you're holding them in working memories and trying to form long-term memories. And then there's one for visual objects. You remember the things in this room that you saw a um, coffee cup or you saw a laptop. And the thing about them, yes. For what? Yes, the, 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 so, so these are locations, so where things are, but then you, the, the other one is the, the what things are. Yes? So, uh, then the down is not the first thing, that is not the last thing, and they were all written in the hippocampus or the hippocampus? Uh, no, the hippocampus is, they would converge in the hippocampus, we'll, we'll see that in a few in a few minutes, uh, but uh, yes, it, it is. Uh, you've got to store locations as well as what the objects are and the words are. But you can fill up one compartment, and the other compartment could be empty, and you can add more to it. Um, that's important. So another characteristic of working memory. It is is the following. So, what I want you to to look look at this this square here, and you see an object appear here, and then one one appear over here, let's say, or the opposite. And you're asked to, while looking here, uh, determine whether it was the same object or a different object. Hmm? Different. Different. Okay. The next one. Same. Okay. I guess that's it. Just do two. <laughs> okay. Um. So what? What? What was? Interesting here is that that you first saw the object over on this part of the retina, and then you saw the object, the other object, on the other part of the retina, and so it's not memorizing this 
in terms of its retinotopic coordinates, um, it me memorizing these things as an object. So in object-centered coordinates. I'm not memorizing, holy in your working memory. So working memory is, is, is something we saw. Remember the PH, you got a action potential goes in and it tells you that the eye is moving and another signal goes out and it contracts the muscles. But then over here, it, it goes round and round and round and keeps the eye at its eccentric position. And also it, that signal is that it becomes your quality discharge and it, it is your internal representation of where the eye is. And that signal is used by the superior colliculus to move that hill across. So in a sense, that's the quiet discharge is a form of working memory. But all the other working memories that occur in the frontal lobe are, you know, circuits like this. They're temporary circuits. You hold them for a while and then they, they, they get discharged and you forget it. On the other hand, long-term memories are more like this, where you physically change the strength of a series of neurons. Okay? And these, these synapses become larger and often more synapses. And in the case of, of procedural reflexive memory, uh, it takes, it's gradual, you need to repeat this several times for this memory to, to form. Now we saw again that the key to, uh, to forming these memories is synchronous activity. So these two neurons are firing at the same time, these two neurons are firing at different times. And gradually these ones get stronger and these ones become weaker. That's right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um. I know it's 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 a, there's no difference. It's an object-centered coordinates. So we said working memory just now is an object-centered coordinates, and we we looked at Mona Lisa. She's stored in long-term memory in object-centered coordinates too. And the problem there was that the object-centered coordinates are sort of in, 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 um, stored in, in, in a sort of canonical, the, 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 the way you most often see Mona Lisa, right side up. Okay, so you have an up, a down, a left, and a right on her, on her, in, in, her, in, in your head, in your memory. And when visually you saw the mouth upside down, you, that wasn't the way it's stored in your brain in working memory or in long-term memory. And so you had to um, try to, if you were trying to do this repetitively, recognize whether the face was changed or not, um, try to rotate the, the lips in your brain and match them to what you had in your memory. And that would take practice. So yes, uh, they both have similar problem or properties, the working memory and the long-term um, storage of objects. <coughs> okay, here we have my oldest granddaughter, Riley, and we're gonna, use her to show, use her face to show an, an example of learning procedural memories. Okay? And this is called classical conditioning. And what we're going to try to do is um, get Riley to blink to the, um, to a sound, but not to a light. So, for, for first of all, test. 
that's still the light. But that's a no, that's a sound, and that's the light. Okay, and notice that she hasn't blinked for either of those. Okay, so she's naive. He wouldn't like anyone to say that because he's definitely not naive. But so here you can see that she blinked to this puff of air on her eyelid. Okay, and that, that's because this this puff of air is a good teacher. It's a, it always produces a blink response. So we can use it to train her blink response. Okay, so you can see here, there's a puff occurring. And to, to train her blink response, what I've got to do is hit the sound so it's synchronous with the puff. If I do it right, you see the, the synapse getting larger and larger. Okay, so if I, if I produce the sound at the same time as the puff, I've conditioned this reflex so that now just the, the sound will produce a blink, but not the light. Okay, so we just condition this part to blink and not this part. So that's an example of learning procedural memory. So learning how to ski is very similar to that. And um, so we see, we saw that some got strengthened and some became weaker. And it's, and similar things happen to all your long-term memories. Synapses get, become stronger and th synapses become weaker. And so Everything that you remember is due to trillions of these connections in your head changing. And all of you have different connections and all of you are therefore unique. Now, in terms of procedural memories, you can see here, if I do a lesion in the cerebellum or somehow a lesion occurs in the cerebellum, you lose that procedural, this particular procedural you lose the, this trained ability to bleed to a sound. And similarly, if you had a lesion of the cerebellum, you'd, your ability to ski would be lost. Okay, we'll look at another type of procedural memory and some of the properties. So I want you to practice this finger tap. See, so this is your pink, small finger. This is your large or finger closest to your thumb. And I want you to see if you could get this particular sequence memorized. Okay. And now we'll try to do it a little faster. And now faster still. Okay. Now try this one. And faster. And faster still. Now try this one. The first one. You're not as fast. So, um, you'll notice that, that when you're learning these procedural memories, and you've, you've learned it, or at least you're getting pretty fast at learning it. So we can see here that sequence happening. So this you're practicing the first time. Then you practice the second time. Then you try this this one again, you find that you're not as fast, not as skilled. So this one is interfering. It's disrupting. This new one disrupts what you've just put in your long-term memory. Okay? Or uh, you're, you're, you're uh, in the process of putting. 
in, in, in your long-term memory. One interesting thing is that if you practice, then you wait, then you practice the second one, then your first one is not disrupted. So if there's a gap between sequence one and sequence two, sequence two won't disrupt sequence one. So if you wait a while, this, this memory of this thing is consolidated and becomes robust. It, it, it becomes persistent and resistant to interference. Now, we'll add one more complication. Okay, you practice it. You test the first one. Then you practice the second sequence. Now it's disrupted, the first sequence. So you practice the first sequence. The only thing different, you wait a while, let it consolidate. But then when you test it again, it seems to have become, but again, not resistant to change. So practicing the first sequence opens it up in a sense, makes it uh, plastic again. Um, so you can see that uh, practice, practicing memories sometimes makes them unstable. And this applies not only to procedural memories. A lot of times um, you can remember episodes in the past, and as you remember them, they become suggestive to change. So somebody can say things like, uh, like, like you're, you're, you're in a court of law, and during the trials, people make suggestions as to what you really saw and what you didn't see, and you misplace it. You, those memories become altered. Um, similarly, when you um, remember something and you and see a picture of yourself, those you have, you'll have trouble deciding whether or not um, you actually remember that, or was it because you saw the picture of yourself doing it? The other neat thing is you practice the first sequence and you wait a while, and then you go to sleep here. The next day, oops, you can do a test before you go to sleep. The next day after a sleep, you find that you've improved just by sleeping. Um, and we, we found for a lot of things, your memories become enhanced, so not only this type of procedural memory, but for all kinds of memories. And there's a lot of debate as to what type of sleep is essential. You go through different phases of sleep, and one of them, for example, is REM sleep, and the other one's slow wave sleep. Um, and it, it's still not sure which of these you really need to get this enhancement. Now, where does this change? Well, one of the places, as, as in this case, this memory, is changing in the motor cortex. This motor cortex representation of these fingers is becoming larger. And they've seen, for example, in violinists, a violinist um, will use a left hand, usually, for the fingering. And then her right more representation in her right motor cortex of her fingers um, becomes larger. Okay, so this area has expanded because of all the practice that violinist has done. Same thing with the auditory cortex. If you practice. Um, recognizing 
music or sounds at a particular frequency or around a particular frequencies, you'll find that this those frequencies expand in terms of the representation um, and the other frequencies shrink. And um, you can also do practicing. Um, we can be shown lines with a tiny little break in it. Okay, you see this tiny little break here. Um, and with practice, you, you, you train the person by making the little break smaller and smaller and smaller. And you find that this person can tell um, breaks in this these two lines um, gets better and better and better. But then you test them with a line of a different orientation and he doesn't have a, a memory for that orientation. He can, so all, all the expertise that he built for this orientation is not, doesn't exist for the other ones. So it's as if um, in that, um, those, those columns, uh, the wedges that you have for the different orientations, the possibility is that this orientation expanded at the expense of the other orientations. So one of the things, especially in terms of procedural memories, is they continue to be consolidated throughout life in the primary and motor regions, primary sensory and primary motor regions. Now, we'll move on to a different type of memory. And to look at this different type of memory, we look at a famous patient uh, whose initials are HM, and he was studied by a scientist called Brenda Milner. I believe she's still alive in her, in her 90s and publishing papers. And she's uh, at McGill. And this gentleman here, HM, at 27 of it, years of age, because of an accident, a bicycle accident at youth, he developed epilepsy. And to relieve this epilepsy, uh, this part of the brain, the medial temporal area, of, uh, lobe, lobe area, um, including an important part called the hippocampus, was removed on both sides. Um, and it had an unexpected effect on one type of memory. Uh, just because before coming here, this um, removal of parts of the brain for epilepsy um, is still done. I was talking to a, a friend of mine or whose brother um, I had his frontal lobe removed just a few years ago here at UH because of epilepsy. And of course, guess what he has trouble with? Pardon me? Working memory, exactly. Yeah, yeah he, has, he, he has trouble with working memory. Luckily, it was just one side, his right uh, frontal lobe was removed, so he still has his left, so his speech is is good, he can understand sentences, uh, he can produce sentences, uh, but he still has trouble with working memory. Anyways, what type of deficit did this person have? Well, he had, um, his working memory was fine as opposed to when you lost your temporal frontal lobe. He can remember if you're a doctor and you walked into his room, uh, you told him, your name, you remember it as long as you wasn't distracted or as long as you did walk out of the room and then come back later, at which time he would have forgotten who you were. His procedural memory was also good, okay? He, his old skills, for example, language was still perfect and he could still learn new skills like he learned to golf later in life. 
but his problem was in this declarative memory. His old memories were fine. So declarative memories that he had formed early before the, the surgery on his temporal lobe. Okay? Those old, old memories were still intact. But he couldn't form new memories. So, for example, that doctor walked in, uh, told him his name, walked out, came back in, lost. I remember, had, would not recognize him, even. You know, not, not that would just remember his name, but would remember his face, or that he had ever seen him. So he had anterior grade amnesia. So um, he he had all his memory, old memories were retained. He just couldn't form new ones. So this is the time of the surgery. <coughs> Retrograde amnesia is when we start losing things in the past. So we once remembered where we lived, but now we've forgotten where we lived. So this is a picture of H.M. He died at the age of 82. And remarkably, he could recognize, recognize himself, let's say, in this picture, because he was still young. But he was unable to recognize himself at the age of 82 in front of me, because he, he had changed. These aren't the memories that he had stored early in life. And he couldn't form new memories of himself. And it, it, it's neat, he was a very bright gentleman. Um, he would uh, take, write a diary every day of things that happened to him as they happened to him. And then the next day, he'd read this diary, and it was like reading something that somebody else had written. So it's just like everything is in the present, nothing is in the past. Nothing in the past ever existed for him anymore. So what happens here? Okay. So how do you encode these? So we we saw the, the the what stream going underneath the brain, up to the frontal lobe. Okay, and that we encode things temporarily in front of the lobe in an object center reference frame, and we store them temporarily in working memory. That signal from working memory feeds back to the structure called the hippocampus. And unlike these uh, procedural memories, like skiing, where you have to practice and practice and practice until really you get skiing right, hippocampus is a great teacher, and it seems to be able to rec uh, remember things with just one trial. Okay. How it does that is still a bit of a mystery. But and it's located here. Okay, you can see uh, as you follow the gray matter around, around you know, so this, is, this is the beginning of the temporal lobe here. Okay, this is that Sylvian fissure, the big crack. So the auditory system would be about here. And then you go around, around, around underneath here. And you have the fusiform face area and the fusiform place area. And then keep going round and round and round, tucked up way up here at the very most medial part of the brain is your hippocampus. And you can see it over here in the side view. Here you see the eye and the olfactory system coming in this way from the nose. Okay. So, um, one of the unique things about this area is that new neurons form here. So the ventricles are nearby, and from these ventricles, from the, the area near the ventricles, you start to develop new neurons, and quite a few, about a thousand a day. Um, the other, all, only other place in the brain that forms new neurons is, we'll see, uh, uh, is the olfactory bulb, bulb you saw um, in the taste lecture how the olfactory bulb um, forms 
neurons. And you can see here how the memories form. So that you get memories of all kinds of things that you learned in the past, and they 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 are activate. You got memories from the frontal what you're seeing currently from the frontal association areas, and then um, things that you saw in the past, and they all meet here in the hippocampus, and it then signals back to these areas and also to new ones, forming new associations that you now remember. So it forms new connections and strengthens the relevant old ones. And so, for example, you can see that that uh, uh, if you had remembered uh, somebody's face and then you heard the voice, you form an association between the face and the voice using this, 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 the hippocampus. And as throughout life, you form more and more of these associations with the people that you have in your life. And these long-term memories, again, would, would involve changing the structure, the synapses, and that would involve the expression of genes and the synthesis of proteins. Now, PPH, uh, no, PPH, HM shows us that once these memories are formed, okay, um, he, they don't need the hippocampus anymore. So he lost his hippocampus, but he could still remember the, the, the people in his past, his father, his mother. He could remember, um, he was very good at doing the lawn every day because he could remember where the lawnmower was and uh, what, the, what the task was to do the lawnmower. He had to remember what he had done and not done because of his working memory. So, and again, um, where the, the synapses are formed are in large part the, the, the regions that are activated when you um, see or hear the, 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 these uh, sounds or see the uh, pictures. And um, of course these memories then uh, if you activate something by your sense of smell or your sense of taste they, those, those, those can trigger a wealth of memories of things in the past. Now, these, um, you can remember that these oceans are very good at storing things like maps that um, help you find your way home. And one of, the, one of the things that have been studied in the rats is uh, hippocampal cells that are called place cells. And they um, get activated by a particular combination of either auditory somatosensor or, or olfactory cues. Now the way that uh, people have studied these place cells is interesting. What, what they do is uh, place a rat in a water maze. Now what the water maze consists of is a, like a child's pool of the bathing pool that they would put out the, on a sunny day outside in the backyard and you fill it with liquid but the liquid is cloudy like milk so you you put this cloudy liquid inside the pool and then you place objects around the visual objects you place a platform in the pool and then you place the rat in the pool and what happens is that the rat swims around and eventually, by sheer luck, finds where the platform is. It doesn't like swimming, so it 
pretty adept at finding this, hunting it, and finding this platform. Now, the neat thing is that um, the next time you put the rat in the platform and you haven't changed any of these visual cues, the rat will swim directly towards the platform. So he's remembered that that platform is location in terms of the associations with these visual cues, these landmarks. So it's, you can see that the firing rate of these play cells seems to direct the rat towards this platform. Now, if you take this rat and remove his hippocampus, um, you, you'll find that, that you can place a new rat in, in a new um, water maze, and he won't be able to, 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 wreck, um, to find the, 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 the cue ever. But if you take a rat that's already memorized where the platform is, and then remove its uh, hippocampus, um, that rat will find the platform without any problem. So again, it, like H. Chemet shows, that the memory of these associations isn't stored in the hippocampus itself, but just that the hippocampus allows these memories to form. Some other things about a working memory in the frontal lobe is that they're critical in making decisions. So let's suppose um, you you're hear a sound of a phone, and that's stored in working memory. At the same time, your eyes tell you that you're in your own house. Okay? Your reaction, the decision, is that you probably should answer that phone. Now, if on the other hand, you hear a sound, but your vision tells you that you're in a friend's home, you make a completely different decision using the frontal lobe. Okay? So again, um, you, you, you need the frontal lobe in, so that you can take these working memories and based on these working memories, uh, make decisions. And again, um, these, these are not just working memories, but also in part long-term memories, because you've recognized this is your friend's home, or in the previous case, it's your own home, and you've recognized that this is a, the sound of a telephone. So you need those two long-term memories to make that decision. Yes? Well, yes, it could, it could, 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 have, could have been stored in your long-term memory and, and still was, except that you had trouble retrieving it. So uh, that, that could have been the problem, the, the, re, the retrieval of it was difficult. And sometimes what you do with, with, with practice is that you, you learn more associations so you, uh, with, with, with a PPH somehow with the word itself, you know, um, different things, and then you can retrieve it based on those associations. Um, I, I, when I try to learn a new name, I try to say, okay, that name that it's that can associate it with something else, and then I can think of that something else to retrieve that name. Was there another question? Another structure that's that's interesting is this amygdala. The amygdala is located deep in your brain, and it's involved in sort of emotional responses, like fear, 
Uh, sometimes it's not fear, but something quite pleasant. And here, we'll, we'll, I'll, I'll try to associate um, a sound with a bit of a startle, but probably not going to be much of a startle for you guys because the sound will be very... Okay, if I turned up the volume. Okay. So this experiment was done, but with like a, a foghorn type sound that would suddenly blurt out at you. Okay. And it would startle you. And of course, um, what it did here was that so every time so it changed color, but every time it was blue, the synapse would strengthen. Okay. So now if you were to to just play the um, after it was strengthened, just the blue color alone would elicit this response associated with the startle, a bit of a sweating response. Now, so in a normal person, okay, um, then a blue light on its own could produce a sweating after you get conditioned like that. So you're activating your amygdala and through this amygdala you produce the sweating. But if you're leaving the amygdala you can't learn the, the you won't learn the sweating response. Okay? You won't be able to train to associate to produce sweating whenever you're sh shown a blue stimulus. But if you leave from the hippocampus, you'll still produce sweating, but you won't be able to remember why you're starting to sweat, that it's the blue color that triggers it. So it's involved in all kinds of... Uh, Emotional to to uh, things. Um, one of the, one of the things that's associated with is uh, uh, familiarity. So often um, you can um, you, you you see things and they're familiar to you. Um, so that f familiarity comes quickly. But other times it's 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 something that uh, like you see a lion immediately triggers a, stre a stress thing and that that involves release of epinephrine and it causes your heart to beat rapidly and you're better able physically to escape from this lion. Now, this a, the pathway from at least the visual system through the, the, the amygdala to the autonomic responses is very fast because you some, it's an advantage to have these fast responses. And they, they often occur, for example, when you see it, somebody coming and you recognize have the sense of familiarity before you figure out who that person is. Okay. I've known, you know, I've, I've seen you before, or something like that. And then you figure out, oh yeah, I've seen you. That's where I saw you. So you have this fast recognition system that just tells you familiarity versus, oh, this is a stranger, you know, like must be early in our development that you, we could recognize members of our own tribe versus some neighboring tribe that you worry about. And then this other pathway um, is, is another one that involves in the conscious identification, identification of who that person is. Well, interesting is, is, is that so when we lose this pathway, we, we lose the ability to identify the person. So you can see these blank faces, you don't know who they are. But when you lose this pathway, we lose the sense of familiarity. So this was a young man who lost this pathway, and he claimed to the doctors that his parents were taken over by aliens. And the reason for that is that whenever he saw them, 
he could recognize these are my parents, but no sense of familiarity would, would be elicited. Okay, the last thing I want to do is do this last, hit your table as hard as you can. Okay, okay. and the thing is to, to, to hit it when you think the face is familiar. <laughs> Anyways, that was pretty good. Yeah, so, so you can see how, how fast it was. You can see how it, it was, the familiar, familiarity came quickly, but also it was amazingly fast that you could also recognize who that person was. You could identify it. Too. So the other pathway is not a slouch either. They, they were, the, the, the nervous system was amazing in terms of its speed. And so, it's remarkable how, how in a fraction of a second, you can do this. Um, and what's neat about it is that, you know, when you see these faces as you're learning them, uh, Mandela, you know, you, you probably saw different visions of him from all over the retina. And then somehow, you can recognize that, that it was Mandela or Einstein or whatever, just in... Uh, wherever wherever we show Einstein, and so somehow a unique, this unique group of neurons in the FFA gets activated each time. And the the neat thing, or the remarkable thing, is that we still don't know how the brain does that magic. Okay, thank you. <laughs>